Having sleep tracker data can be fantastic, but if you have no idea what the heck you're looking at and you are overwhelmed by the data, it almost doesn't matter because if you get the wrong insights from the right data, guess what? Overall, everything is still wrong and you're not sure what interventions that you're bringing into your lifestyle or different changes that you're making are having a positive effect, a negative effect, or no effect. And that can always completely change the trajectory of what you're doing in your health journey. So that's why I asked in my Facebook group all about sleep apnea, of course, hey, do you guys want me to look over some of your overnight data? And I was a little surprised that a lot of people did. So <laughs> I figured I'd just start looking at things and, and make this a more regular series so that if this is your report, and don't you worry, first thing I do is de-identify this information. If this is your report, then you gain direct insights from this. And if it's not, you still gain data points of understanding. Hey, this pattern means that, and I should do this. So here we go. First thing first is what are we looking at together here? So it is very important when I'm looking at data of what device we're using. Now there's no one perfect device. I really do like the EMA device, but there's many other overnight pulse oximeters that are also great. And here's the thing, just because if you've been told you have sleep apnea or you suspect it, it does not mean you need a pulse oximeter overnight. Sometimes in less severe cases or more mild cases, something like an Oura Ring or a Fitbit that doesn't accurately track oxygen overnight, you may not need that, okay? You, you could be fine with just an Oura Ring or a Fitbit. All depends on your severity, what you're tracking and all of that. Now, if you're someone like when we're working with people and let's say we're working to get them off of their CPAP, having a device like this is super, super important. Now, continuing on with this, when I'm looking at this, my very first question is, is this data real? Is this data real? Because if you're looking at something, it just completely looks like a bunch of garbage, then chances are it's going to be a bunch of garbage. So the person who submitted this, they did say their pulse ox fell off at one point in the night. I'm willing to bet when that was right around here when we have these really big ups and downs. If I didn't know that, however, then I would be having a different interpretation of this. Or we have one client who he is, his smoke alarm went off in the middle of the night because the battery was low. If I'm not able to explain different anomalies with the data, then it's going to lead to erroneous conclusions and not getting anywhere or somewhere fast enough. So when I'm looking at data like this, one thing I wanna make sure is is there a normal rhythm and pattern? Because our oxygen levels and our pulse rates are never just this straight line that would just go right across and be right at 98% the entire night. There's gonna be natural variation all the time. Same thing with your heart rate as well. There's gonna be a natural rhythm. Different stages of sleep, like REM sleep, your heart rate actually goes up a little bit. So there's gonna be some variation. So when I see and I'm looking at this curve, this looks like a very typical sort of level of rhythm in someone with sleep apnea. So we have some areas where we're going about some lines here, about 94%. We're going up and down this, up and down, and sometimes you have these relatively small excursions downward. We already know this is the pulse ox coming off, but we have some other excursions as well. We go down here, and another big dip, and another big dip, and another big dip, and another big dip. So we have many of those different dips. This is very typical. What would be not typical is if it's like really up and down and crazy movement. A lot of people mistake that as a really bad test, but if it's in such a short time frame, it's likely the sensor because your oxygen levels can only change so fast, <laughs> okay? So if someone's having these like big swings every 10 seconds, you couldn't do that if you try by holding your breath while awake. So I wanna make sure the data isn't too all over the place. This is within range. Now, to have the eye for that, it just takes time looking at a lot of these to know that. Then next, I'm looking at the pulse and being able to ask myself, okay, how many of these events were physiologically significant? And when I'm looking for that, and even though I said that let me get it out my marker that these two here 
this was a artifact, aka something that's not actually representing what's going on. Uh, but nonetheless, it does reflect a pattern you would see. And this pattern I'm referring to, well, maybe I should look at a different place, is here, where you have a decrease in the auction levels. If you draw a line straight down, there should be a corresponding peak. Let me zoom in on this and show you. This valley of the oxygen should meet with the corresponding peak of pulse. That tells me that this was a physiologically significant desaturation. Not all desaturations or dips in oxygen are the same. Many times we need to make sure that this is matching up. And if we see a lot more of these matches, that means the oxygen desaturations are more significant. So there you go. That's one thing I want to look at. Are these peaks occurring? And it looks like we have many of those. Now, one thing right away, whoever this is, I mean, I know who it is, but whoever you are out there, I'm not going to say your name for privacy's sake. But when we look at the pulse, this is a lot of movement in a very little amount of time from 60 to 70 to 55 up to 75 down to 50 up to 65 and this is within each tick mark it's going to be 25 minutes here so each one of these is 25 minutes so this is likely like a 10 minute time frame like this is what you get if you were to start like going up and down the stairs a lot of stairs in a 10 minute time frame so there may be something because when we look at the auction levels here these don't correspond to like these big ups and downs so this can be a few things one number one thing the biggest mistake people make with overnight pulse asymmetry is they do not clean their fingertip not even like a sanitation thing it's just if you have any stuff on your fingernail or your skin here it's going to affect how the sensor can sense things properly so make sure public service announcement you clean your fingernail your finger alcohol swab is the best and then when you put the sensor on it some scotch tape or even some medical tape etc just to make sure it stays in a good position so that's gonna be the first thing so now i'm already thinking okay well if the pulse rate is this high there could be some heart issues in the mix because sleep apnea is one of the number one contributors to afib when the electrical activity is off and you're having ups and downs and ups and downs a lot. Also, it will make your heart more reactive in the first place because sleep apnea overactivates your sympathetic nervous system and then leads to a, a jolty heart at rest like we see here. Uh, could also be artifact still. However, I'm less likely to feel it's artifact just based on the nature that this oxygen curve looks pretty good. It looks like something that I would typically see. So this is where it's hard to do these in a way because usually like today on our group q a in talking with one of our clients i was able to have this graph well not this graph like he had his own separate graph that i'm going to keep private and then i was able to talk to him and walk through a lot of these things and ask him some more questions but nonetheless i think we can say that this is overall a valid picture there's likely i mean honestly because i know the age of this person likely uh an underlying heart issue contributing to the reactivity of the pulse rate. All right, so I do a visual overview first, and then we want to look at some of the basic numbers here. So in using one of these trackers, you may be confused, like what's ODI 4% versus ODI 3%, so on and so forth. What the heck does all this mean? For a device like this, and overall all commercially available overnight pulse oxes, I would put your eggs in the basket of the ODI 4%. It's gonna be more specific. And what this means is that you had a drop in oxygen of 4% for at least 10 seconds. That's what happened. ODI 3% will be a drop in 3% for at least 10 seconds. Now, once again, not all of these are physiologically irrelevant. Just because we can count it doesn't mean it honestly really counts. Because think about it, if you went from 97% oxygen to 94% oxygen, you're still in a good healthy range. It dropped, but it's not going to be something that leads to a negative response at a cellular level. That's why I'm always seeing from the get-go, how significant 
are these drops? Are these physiologically meaningful drops in oxygen? Or is it something where, okay, mathematically it happened, yes. It's important to identify what is a meaningful event. Now, this is not to minimize and say that having 23.6 events and only a handful or probably a dozen, if I was to go through and trace a whole lot of these, it doesn't mean that we can minimize this number. This is still not good. These are not good numbers. And it would be helpful to know how this correlate with symptoms. I would imagine not great, not great at all. So when we look at these, we just want to be able to ascertain, okay, this is the number. If we were to write down and track something over time, let me say that again. If you were to write down a number and track it over time, it would be the ODI for percent. And then a massively important one is the percent of time in ODI for percent. You could do the total time, but people have different sleep lengths, etc., and that can become a tricky variable by itself. All right, so we talked about these numbers here. Then these numbers here, they're kind of useless to me personally, because if we know like the max, the min, the average, it doesn't really say a whole lot. It's a lot more important to look at these numbers. A lot of people get caught up in these numbers. I would recommend that you don't, just because it's not the most fruitful thing to, to do that, okay? because the average doesn't tell you what the peaks and the valleys are. So don't freak out about that. Now, this table over here is another great one to track. Now, this table of numbers is important to track. And the way I like to look at the most at a glance is the percentage of this first row versus the rest of them. <laughs> okay, to see how those change over time. Now this will be different depending if you have a different baseline of oxygenation and all that, but that's just how I usually look at that and track that over time. These other ones, these thresholds, given that different people have different physiological setups, some people hang around in the low 90s, some people hang around in the high 90s, and also the artifact of the measuring device, these absolute thresholds, again, Honestly, because of the artifacts of commercially available devices, these absolute thresholds, I don't put a lot of weight into. So we have talked a lot about stuff here. Well, let's talk <laughs> about this actual curve and what we can start to ascertain. So in looking at this, I want to pay the most attention to this oxygen curve here. So we have many instances where we dip down, we dip down, another big dip down, big dip, big dip, big dip. You have a lot of these, almost in a cluster. You can see that there's more activity here. And then comparison over here, this is a little bit less dramatic up and down, a little bit less dramatic over here. And then we have another area of activity. So it's on even. That makes sense how, again, it was busy, quiet, relatively quiet, relatively quiet, busy again. And then busy, busy, pretty much the same in this block. This is when it fell off and then it's back on. And then we're busy, quiet over here. If you can see the little hand marker, if I zoom in, you can see more of that. Relatively quiet, relatively quiet, relatively quiet, relatively quiet. This is such a, a sharp peak, I'm gonna ignore it, part of the artifact, then we get a little bit more dramatic. So typically this is gonna be a pattern of where it may be likely that the position in which someone's sleeping is changing and is a big factor for someone's oxygenation. Because when position is not involved, you'll see a, a typical pattern throughout the night, whether it's X events over a certain amount of hour, it's, it's more steady. It's not this pattern of busy, quiet, busy, quiet, 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 busy, busy. It's not like that. So it's important to be able to discern that. So for this individual, again, I know your name, but I don't really know your symptoms. I think working on your position, especially sleeping on your side, might be beneficial and being able to smooth out how this curve looks because this pattern really indicates some sort of positional involvement, all right? 
So that would probably be the, the biggest take home of this in terms of action steps, whether it's side sleeping or strengthening muscles in your airway, whichever muscles would be best. I'm not sure, because again, <laughs> I don't know more about you, but I got videos on that as well that would be important. And then of course, really just with any of this, having the breathing exercises additionally are super helpful. But once again, which ones are gonna be the bestest? I don't really know. And in making those changes, what you could expect is to smooth this out, have a more sort of evenness to the how often the events are happening instead of having these clusters, then they're absent and clusters, so on and so forth. And then probably, because once again, I think it's more likely, I know I was on the fence earlier, but I think it's more likely this is a heart problem secondary to having sleep apnea for such a long time. Because the only thing I know is age and how long this person's had sleep apnea. So that would be my insights there. So if you want to be able to have me look over the same or just continue to do this series, I'll I'll put the link to our Facebook group in the description. That's what it's called, right? The description on YouTube. You can do that there. Uh, as this series builds, I'll put videos like over my face or the playlist. You can click a button there. And of course, if you want to be able to have a level of individualization in personalizing things for you, not just with this, but like all the different factors in your health and your life, then what I would really recommend that you do is to get a free one-on-one -on -one evaluation session. That's a call where we just talk about what's going on, what your goals are, and what the paths that get you there are. And if we can help, we'll talk about that. If not, steer you to whatever's best. So that's at ochnow.com forward slash talk. Thanks so much for listening and watching, and I'll see you or talk to you soon.